So this is part of my big map that I've been working on and I'll share the slides and I have source links so you can sort of zoom into different parts of the map. Uh, this part has uh, Elon Musk is sort of the center there. And, you know, I pulled out, I know he has many, many companies, but, you know, some of the most prominent ones, you know, Hyperloop and Neuralink and S Starlink satellites and Tesla and, and Twitter is in there. Um, Raul brought to my attention yesterday the Open AI Collaborative, um, which is sort of a, a platform, an op open standards platform, because as we mentioned with the, those NVIDIA um, interviews, that the metaverse is going to be open standards. They're going to create standards and then it's sort of plug and play. And as long as everyone is, is um, you know, fits into the system, you can build it exponentially, right? And so they're looking to create artificial intelligence systems um, that that are collaborative to help build out this artificial reality. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, there are a number of other platforms that are linked into social impact finance and the impact data collection. But it's interesting to realize that both um, in Stripe and in um, the open AI that Peter Thiel is, is, is a backer of both of those. And the idea of paying for content, content creation. So that's part of the reinforcement mechanism, right? Is that you create social media platforms and then you reward certain behaviors. And we know that those rewards currently exist in terms of view counts and sort of dopamine hits and affirmation and comments. But eventually there's a plan for all of this to be monetized and, but monetized in a way that I, I describe as behavioral script, pretty much. So I would say while Elon Musk is out front and he does have these connections, you know, there's part of me that wonders to what extent he as an individual is actually responsible for these companies versus that he is a character playing the person who's responsible for these companies. And I think that there's a difference in that, um, that we need to understand it as a performance really, as opposed to um, a firm and fixed reality. Um, I would say that what's behind this is actually more uh, that Twitter is the, the toy of MIT Media Lab and the social physics programming and has been for a long time. And so that is the, the crux of the conversation to be having. Although at the beginning, I do want to touch on a couple of aspects of Elon Musk's sort of family background that beyond his business holdings, I think might inform how we think about uh, social engineering and electrical engineering. One of the pe people that I'd like to talk about a little bit in the context of Musk is actually his grandfather, Joshua Norman Haldeman, who was a uh, he was the son of Canada's first chiropractor, and he was a pilot, an adventure pilot, and he was involved in the technocracy movement, um, which is something that that you know Patrick Wood you know talks a lot about uh, the technocracy movement, uh, which came out of the U.S. and Columbia University. But he actually ran afoul of the Canadian government at some point, and then decided to relocate the entire family to uh, South Africa. Um, just a few years after apartheid was was um, implemented, and at the time South Africa was, you know, again Canada, South Africa, you know, crown colonies to attract, you know, white, you know, affluent white families to come, and it was sort of like, look, we've we've got this great thing going here. So within the context of uh, geofencing and passports and you know biometric pass systems, I, I feel like that's that's a, a notable something of note. I think what we really should be talking about is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology <laughs> and its its history in the war machine, its history in venture capital, its history in signals intelligence. And, you know, the fact that it's, you know, right there in Boston, you know, we've got Harvard that does a lot of the policy work and MIT does a lot of the technology work and, and also um, business policy and digital currency. Um, but it's embedded because of its its situation as an you know an elite academic institution, and then being in Massachusetts, there's quite a number of things as we go through today of reflecting on liberalism, or as we commonly understand it. And I will say, when I first started out in my education work, um, Massachusetts is sort of uplifted as um, you know very good education system, very progressive state. It has this certain aura about it, and the more I I experienced both connections with people who were um, in the education activism space in Massachusetts, 
the murkier things got. And then the more I started to dig into social impact finance and into the military, I was like, wow, it's kind of like California. I'm like, Massachusetts, you aren't exactly what I thought, but then maybe you were. Like, maybe if we understand it as, you know, the pilgrims and this manifest destiny, maybe it is what we thought, but maybe how we think about it should change. So um, anyway, so this is uh, the lab of uh, Warren McCullough. He was one of the, the, the key people in uh, the cybernetic space. He was a neuropsychiatrist. He was very interested in embodiments of mind. And in the last couple of conversations we've had, we've talked a lot about um, both with what's left and I think that the Alice uh, discussion we had about creating cognitive models, uh, understanding how the mind works. Where is mind? Where is consciousness? How do these things interact? How do individual minds interact with other minds? And that has been a fixture of interest for a very long time, um, you know, most of the 20th century, right? And, but it really picked up steam uh, in biocomputation in the, the post-war era, because now they started to have instruments that they could use to um, make additional hypotheses about how the, they thought the mind worked. And so these, um, the Macy conferences, as I, as I mentioned, they started, they ran from uh, 1946 to 1953, and were very much about engineering both biological processes, um, Arturo Rosenbluth, he was a collaborator with Norbert Wiener, and he was a physiologist interested in um, neural signals, both of the heart and the mind. And um, and then again, like we have Warren McCullough. But, you know, they look like you wouldn't necessarily imagine that humans, um, human control of human beings, right? It's so civilized. It seems like, you know, look, they've got their ashtrays, they've got their books, they're, you know, sitting there. And 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 this is how things are planned out. It, it's not like, it's just, it's just very matter of fact that this is what would happen. And I think this is this is the challenge, even though within the Macy conferences, they were integrating social sciences and uh, uh, you know, life sciences. Regular people aren't in those rooms. Regular people aren't there to say, perhaps th the powers of, of these, these systems that you're imagining could be used to dominate society in ways that we can't fully appreciate right now. You know, on the surface, I was just <clears throat> that title, Embodiments of the Mind. Um, the mind being a physical thing that's embodied. Uh, I, I just think about the title of another book that I have called Philosophy in the Flesh by Lakoff and Johnson. Uh, and that's actually a lot of the foundation of Stephen Newcomb's book is this book. Uh, but it's all it's. It, it just made me, th I don't know if there's even a connection there, but like the idea, the, the book philosophy in the flesh is the idea is there's these concepts, these, these, it's really talking about metaphor and, and there are these ideas that we cannot think about without putting it in, into like a physical like reality, like the embodiment of it. Um, I don't know if there's a connection there or not. Um, but it, it's interesting because what we're dealing with now as they're trying to bring digital minds, really, like these artificial minds that are created in neural networks and digital space out into being embodied in these humanoid robots or not even they don't necessarily even have to be humanoid, but to take a mental model system and then bring it from a digital sphere out into a three-dimensional material world, it's really complicated. And a lot of the, the models that they use are like, how do we get it to walk? How do we get it to, you know, these very basic things that once you become embodied out of a mathematical equation, um, the world gets a lot more complicated and we just do it effortlessly, but this all has to be managed. And I think in some ways, the cyberneticists are seeking for us as embodied beings and beings of, of flesh and mind and emotion and soul to, to be mind, to give that to these agents that are mechanical agents and to use that for that end. And we may not always be knowledgeable, knowing or willing participants in that process, especially children. Yeah. When well, that relationship between the physical and the, you know, things that are kind of not embodied, like uh, a love, you know, like love is mm -hmm. not a, a, you know, a thing that you can hold on to, you know, 
um, and that's what they talk about in this book. It's like how, how we use metaphors, you know, you fall into love. That's a physical activity, but you're not literally falling, you know, it's, it's, but there are these concepts that we can't, we can't wrap our mind around, but it's almost like these people are still, they're trying to take that to the next level. They're trying to literally embody love or embody these, these, these things that are, um, intangible, I guess. I, I don't know if they, if that's the correct way to put that, but you know, but that's saying? for the social engineering. And that's what was, I'll get to a slide a little bit later, but about Jeremy Bentham and his idea in the 18th century of measuring, um, grading different activities as far as if they brought pleasure or pain and then coming up with a calibration and then engineering it towards happiness right and um you know this is something that was mirrored later in within the uh foundation for integrated education picture and Sorapkin. he he wanted to quantify and um robert hartman quantify love quantify alt altruism because if you can't quantify it you can't use it in your simulation you can if, if it's if it if it's not something that you can translate into a mathematical language, you can't use it as an input, and that's part of the background of Twitter. Is I think what they're trying to do is create uh, shocks to systems to try to trigger emotional reactions and then replicate them mathematically and by by discernment of. Um, trigger events and then to to measure it computationally to try to translate that into um sort of a psychic um the social psyche kind of you know a mental status taking the temperature you know of the society based on what you've done to it what you've introduced into the system in this case you know um you know the purchase of, of twitter by a polarizing figure 